Several hundred well-wishers gathered at the gates of the threatened steelworks to see off the hardcore of nine men who will make the 450-mile trek to London. They represent Labour, Liberal and Scottish National Parties, and one is a former Conservative candidate who resigned over the Gartkosh issue. The others are workers at the plant, and one is unemployed. It had been hoped to stage a Jarrow-style mass march to Westminster, but this was abandoned because of the problems of looking after a large number of people during winter weather. And as they set off on the first few miles, the walkers were confident that their efforts would highlight the case for keeping Gartkosh open. Everybody that's interested in the future of Scotland is represented in this march, either right now or will be joining us at stages going down there. Anybody that ignores that is, is going to be foolish, and the Prime Minister's got to listen to the voice of Scotland. The walk's expected to take at least 11 days, with the nine doing the journey in relay. The first major stop will be at the former steel town of Consett in County Durham. But so far, they've been given no guarantee that even when they reach London, Mrs Thatcher will meet them. We had been fighting the fight for Ravenscraig, for the retention of Ravenscraig since 1980 when Ian McGregor first said, close Ravenscraig and we'll save £100 million. Pound. So that had been going on for five years uh, when the threat to Garkosh came along. We immediately recognised uh, the dangers in the closure of Gar Garkosh because, as I said, it, it meant that the added value was going to be lost. Uh, we always maintained that we had a, an, ep an economic argument, an economic case for the, the retention of Ravenscraig, and so therefore it was going to make it extremely difficult if uh, Garkosh or finishing mill was closed. Uh, at the time when the Garkosh announcement came along, um, and I was a regular contributor in television at the time for the Conservative Party, largely because when it came to Garkosh, uh, none of the Tory MPs wanted to appear on the television over it, so the media tended to come to myself, but. Uh, the Conservative Party very quickly found out it was a good idea to have me they'll represent the government's position because uh, I was obviously in favour of keeping Garkosh and the Scottish steel industry going. We had been fighting the fight for Ravenscraig for five years, so we tried a variety of things. We'd been everywhere, spoke to everybody, we'd met people throughout the length and breadth of this land and we'd solicited support from whatever body was prepared to come along and, and help us. And so we were carrying a tremendous support in Scotland, but we had tried everything, and we knew we had the support in Scotland. We didn't know if we had any support anywhere else. And so it was decided that after having tried everything and secured all the support in Scotland, we had to move somewhere else. We decided we would take a case across the border. Well, the, the trade unions at Ravenscraig uh, asked to meet people from each of the political parties and I got a letter from the shop stewards asking me to go out. Now I knew a fair bit about it simply because I'd always been interested in the steel industry for a very brief period in my career I'd worked for British Steel but more important perhaps my father had been involved in the steel industry before the war, the Second World War so I was always interested in steel so I went out to see Tommy. Tommy and Jordy Quinn sat down and explained their case to me which I then went away and examined and when I took it away to examine I was largely looking at the financial figures being a businessman what I was wanting to be absolutely clear about is the plant genuinely profitable, does it have a future, are they making the right products and I came back quite satisfied on all these points and therefore I was happy to commit myself uh, to the campaign to try and save Scottish Steel. Tommy had mentioned to me that we were coming up to this very, very important point where the Parliament was going to vote and we had to put as ma the maximum pressure. So I, I, I was thinking, well, the march might be the way to do it because it's going to give us consistent publicity day after day leading into that. And I went and put the, and the minute I mentioned it, Tommy was right up for it, as was Geordie and the shop stewards. And we thought then it would be quite a simple matter to get everyone's approval, <laughs> how little did we know, you know. So we went along uh, in the morning to Sir Clyde Region uh, and we hoped that they would finance the costs of the, the three vehicles uh, that were required. I mean, everybody that was on the march did it for free. I mean, nobody was getting paid. Uh, we were very, very despondent when the meeting finished and uh, we adjourned to the local hostelry to uh, sort of have a, 
uh, drama and console ourselves and there were five or six of us there. There were myself and George and Bill Irvin, Ian Lawson and Clive Lewis. Uh, and we, after, obviously after a few dramas, you know, the mind starts being totally activated and we're discussing between ourselves, uh, to hell with them, we'll, we'll do it our way, we'll do it, we'll, we'll get we'll get someone, we'll get, we'll get it somehow, we'll do it some way. And, and Ian Lawson happened to mention, uh, why don't we tow a caravan? I said, look, I'll, I'll pay for one of the vans when we're looking at ways of just maybe reducing the size, the number of marchers, uh, if that was possible, and doing it cheaper. I said, look, my company will pay for one of the, the vans, why don't we phone a newspaper and see if they'll pay the cost of the other two in return for having exclusive coverage. I uh, spoke to George and he agreed on condition, he would, he would uh, sponsor the caravan on condition that uh, a photographer and a reporter could go along with us. And of course when he was making conditions, I made conditions as well and I said, right, that's all right, but they're not going to be sleeping in a caravan or staying in a caravan all day, they'll walk along with the rest of us. And he agreed on their behalf, uh, <laughs> which was awful nice of him. Behind the scenes, George McKechnie, the then editor of the Times, was approached and asked if he would like to send a journalist to cover the march. He had to take into consideration would there be enough news value and news content in something which was bit of a significant, uh, uh, well it was quite a significant investment for the paper to send a writer and a photographer for away for would be two weeks but he took the decision that was worth the risks and that's when he asked me and uh, George was quite a big character when he asked you, you tended just to do what he told you so uh, off we went. Just before Christmas when the picture editor shouted me over and says, do you fancy going to London? Well, normally when we went to London, it was Radio 1 DJs or something we were doing, it was great, and you, you lived in the best hotels and all the rest of it. And then he says to me, well, you're walking. I says, oh, I'd love to go. He says, well, you're walking. Oh, and it ruined my Christmas, totally ruined my Christmas. I couldn't believe this, because I was used to the comfort, say, working in a newspaper where you lived in five-star hotels. So it was agreed it would take three uh, <coughs> motorhomes with us, uh, 12 people a maximum uh, and that could fluctuate on on the way down uh, so that's where the idea came from uh, having secured the the support uh, well then we proceeded to have another drum uh, just to celebrate the fact that we we're going to march and uh, that decision only gave us only gave us sort of weeks rather than, than months and it was agreed that we would leave uh, right after the new year. In fact, it was the 3rd of January uh, when we left on that march. But they came to me and said, what do you think? And I said, I think it's a great idea. And we would have this joint uh, you know, venture to walk, to walk to London. And uh, they'd worked out how they would do it and, whatever, and uh, where the money was coming from and all that organisation for it. Um, and we thought, I thought, this is maybe the very thing we do need to really highlight the situation. Jim Wright happened to phone me. He says there's a march. I had no idea what he was talking about, but I agreed to go with him and uh, turned up at Gatkosh on the morning of the march and just went from there, really. That was how it was a simple matter because uh, it was an all, our campaign for the retention of Ravens Craig was a, a sort of an all embracing campaign. Everybody was welcome on board as long as the end objective was the same uh, to secure uh, the future of steel in Scotland. We were worried in case they, they, they would be a bit defensive because obviously people are a bit concerned, they're a bit worried about having journalists with you 24 hours a day. You could imagine that we could have you know, reported the wrong things, taken up a slant which could have shown them in a bad light and and so perhaps they had a certain amount of initial scepticism about it but Tommy was very welcoming he just basically said well you're part of the march now and uh, it was a bit of a shock when he said you'll have to do some of the some of the marching and that wasn't quite part of the plan but Tommy as you know is quite a persuasive character so what Tommy says gets done so uh, Kenny and Craig were <laughs> When they joined us at first, they were very quiet, and uh, but <clears throat> being journalists and 
uh, one was a journalist and the other one was a photographer and he was a sports photographer at that. Uh, they weren't very long in settling down and became one of the group uh, and they, they, they probably were better steel men than we were before the end of the journey. But uh, yeah, they were, they were tremendous uh, good companions to have on the journey. From the, from the outset there was some great camaraderie and I knocked it off. I was very lucky. My vehicle was split up into different vehicles and my bunk mates was Jim Wright, so that was the weight for the van along with me covered. But we had a couple of lightweights along with us as well in the shape of Kerry Smith from the Glasgow Herald uh, and uh, Craig Halkett, uh, the photographer. The good thing was we all got in great right from the start and we probably had the best laugh. I'm absolutely convinced we had the best laugh. We, uh, we we set off with a determination, and I think we were all the same. Okay, some people would be excited, some people would be tense, some people would be apprehensive, but we all certainly were determined, and that was the one common thing that we had. I mean, I, I really didn't know what was happening to begin with. Um, I didn't know how we were going to... No one had actually had... We hadn't time together to sort out you know, how, how it was going to happen. And uh, I didn't know the, the process of, of marching and how we were going to spread the time. Um, so it, I, was, I was absolutely on my own. And actually, at the time that we were being allocated to camper vans, I was just stand, standing chatting to a fellow Liberal Democrats because I didn't know anyone else there. Living under those conditions, it was extremely difficult. and. We started off with snow, and I can always remember, we'd snow all the way to Corby. Well, the first thing was, I was extremely cold because uh, there was a lot of snow on the ground. It was really bitter cold, uh, and uh, but it felt good to be doing something. Um, I had been looking for work, so this was certainly a change in uh, the routine. However, Tommy Brennan, to his credit, so I was in a wee bit of a plight and how miserable I was and decided to move me in beside Ian Lawson. Well, it was like going for Soul Coast to Las Vegas. <laughs> it, that was a baptism of fire. I think it was about minus 17 or minus 20 that night and uh, it was certainly a very cold start uh, to the trip. The weather gradually improved the further south we got as you would expect but uh, I always remember that night. That was the first of a few breakdowns. There was a few breakdowns with vehicles, but you know, when you're travelling it in winter, uh, you know, you've got to expect a problem or two. You know, the route was decided that we would go down the right, the down the the uh, east coast, uh, because our union had offices right down the east coast. We, you know, starting at uh, on the Newcastle side of it, Scunthorpe, uh, Middlesbrough, mm -hmm. down through. Uh, Sheffield down into Corby and the idea was that if something drastic happened, if we needed uh, support of any kind, there was always going to be uh, an ISTC office within sort of hailing distance. Jim Wright, who was the official SNP, um, I suppose he spent the whole night assuring people there was no major plans whatsoever. And just as he'd finished that sentence and watched in, in the pub, well, Jesse Ray, <laughs> the rest up like Robert the Bruce, or I'll roll your boss, whatever you want to choose, and that just set it all off again. Honest to God, I had never heard of Jesse Ray in my life. <laughs> I never heard of him. I, I, I sat there gobsmacked myself. I didn't think there was such a person that existed. <laughs> I don't have a, a tremendous amount of memories of Chedley itself, but I'd certainly have memories of Jesse Ray and his helmet that he had on, the sort of gear that he wore. Uh, he was a an enthusiastic character, uh, a patriot, a Scottish patriot, because he swore uh, that he wouldn't step over the border, and yet we found out that he used to go to Newcastle to fly to the States. So. Certainly raised a lot of publicity uh, locally and uh, in the national papers, which essentially was why we were doing the march anyway. So. And then the very next day we actually got to the border, 
and then you can see this visible sign of relief among a couple of the politicians that there was no great horror spots. And just as they relaxed, we saw this um, flag coming over a hill, a big saw tire, and he said, he started shouting, here they come, here they come. And eventually this line of six people, one behind the other, came over and it was a chap called Anthony Jai C. Kerr, and he came down and met us and gave, pulled out a bottle of whiskey, gave us all a drink and then turned around with salt out and marched into the distance again. There was a tension and I understand why there was, but we actually were playing it cool because strategically we thought this is going to be too important to let, to let some excuse to call it to halt. So. It was really a celebration. It was a, I don't know, I mean he actually focused because he came and you know in, anyone who, who actually came along, it, he wasn't the only one, there were other people who actually came to the border and that whole you know, event of them being there added an awful lot to us because you, you were in the wilds for a while, you weren't sure you know, how, whether you were making any contact with anyone and having them there was a bit of a celebration for all of us. And it was nice that even although he turned up with all his regalia, you know, I don't think he was actually looking for a lot out of that for himself. I think he was really there in support of the Grievance Craig workers. And um, yeah, it was really, really nice to meet him. But he was a tremendous guy uh, and <clears throat> gave us tremendous support. Uh, made sure that uh, we were well fed that night. He looked after us and gave us a. <clears throat> and uh, was a good companion as well. Um, the next day, obviously, you went to Carter's Bar, got your pictures taken, were walked across the border. Now, not af uh, long after that, in Byrness, you came across a road accident. Yeah, we were, we were walk walking along and, uh, and this car passed us and the conditions was bad because, as I indicated earlier, there was snow on the way, with snow all the way. Uh, conditions weren't good at all and uh, this car passed us and uh, when he got to the next bend we saw that he, he had a problem and the car skidded and uh, and overturned. Actually what happened was we'd, we'd parked the car I'm pretty sure we were about to change people coming uh, to take to finish their bit of the walk and people to go out and do the next bit and at that point a car came uh, and overtook because it was going a wee bit too fast for the conditions. There was a lot of snow uh, slush and the next thing this thing was uh, on its roof uh, having uh, flipped over a couple of times. I was myself and Willie Pettigrew uh, and we got out and none of the doors would open because they'd been, the car had obviously rolled and the doors had been damaged. So we had to kick in the back window uh, at the car and I crawled in and pat, pulled the people out and passed them to Willie. Um, Willie Pettigrew and Ian were the big heroes that day. Uh, because the car was overturned and they had to sort of get the the, the back doors open and the, the back hatch open and uh, they were lying on their back sort of passing the children through because there were children in the car uh, passing the children out. Craig Halkett arrived with his camera and uh, he decided that there was all these well-known politicians and trade unionists in the march he decided that Willie Pettigrew had to get some stardom so yeah, at one point I was inside this car I think at the time pulling out hamsters, would you believe? But there was petrol dripping all around me, and I was quite anxious to get back out of this car, believe me. And Craig shouting, don't come out yet, don't come out yet, you have to hand, you have to hand these to Willie, so Willie can be the star. I'm not ready yet to take the photograph, so. And uh, I remember Ian Lawson going in under the car, and there was one or two other folk, and they brought out these little bundles uh, who were obviously trying to escape uh, from this big ugly Tory. But to see the speed that these guys reacted to get the family out, and thankfully nobody was hurt in the accident, but um, it was just incredible. Unfortunately everybody came out of that car and there were nobody really hurt, and the kiddies were very much concerned uh, about their guinea pig, I think, that was left in the car. Uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, I can imagine uh, the feelings of Lawson and and uh, Willie about going back in for guinea pigs. <laughs> They'd got the children out, that was the main thing.
And when we got to uh, where this concept plant had been, it was totally astonishing. I said, and there was this chap, I think I was telling you earlier, was describing, this is where the railway came in, and this is where the, but this is where the trains came in delivering the ore and whatever it was. And there was this where the coke ovens were, and this is where that was, and nothing there. And there was this film of snow. Coins that, you know, well, I mean, how can you not be moved by that? You move in, you're on a steel maps trying to save thousands of Scottish jobs, and you arrive in a town where just a few years previously, they, you know, literally 10,000 people or more had lost their jobs, and you see the effect on the town, the fact that the whole area was barren, uh, you know, that they hadn't been able to replace the jobs in that town, despite all the assurances that were made at the time. So I think it heightened your awareness of just how important what we were doing, you know, we were doing at that time, and the value of it as well, because when or lose, it was important people knew that folk didn't just lie down, that folk stood up and tried to fight it. The whole industrial scene was impacting in exactly the same way. And when you went through the North East, it was really quite alarming when you would look at a place and see, and they would say, see that nice green hill there? That's where the steelworks were. And, you know, that had gone, everything had gone, it had been, re it had been turned into a, a totally different environment. Um, a lovely environment, but I mean, I just thought it was quite dramatic the way these things had been changed. The person who was uh, was on the march had to return home, and uh, that was the convener of a ch uh, church in NDC in those days, and did phone me up to say that he had to go back home. Would I come and join the march? And that's that was my involvement in it. I, I think they they were probably only settling in as well. And uh, oh no, it was it was very very good. I mean, there's a lot of banter, you know, uh, between us all, and and of course uh, we, we did a bit of cooking in the, the caravan in the um, in the caravanettes, and uh, it, it was great. I just remember how cold it was. That was all. <laughs> it, was, it was freezing. There was. A set of golden rules, basically, on this march. Do you remember what they were? Always tell the truth. Uh, don't claim the closure of another plant. Uh, the retention of the five major plants was the thing that we always insisted on. Uh, <coughs> Don't claim something that you can't prove to be correct, because if you did make a statement about something that was proved to be incorrect, uh, well then, you would lose your credibility. So we always had to retain our credibility. And it was along these lines that we conducted ourselves and we conducted our campaign, not just during the Gar Garkosh march, but from 1980 till the plant closed, it was always those golden rules were always applied at, uh, at all times. In Middlesbrough, you had a, a Lord Provost, a Lord, Lord Mayor, and that very formalised. And no, I remember there was no crusts on the sandwiches. Uh, they were having real problems, you know. Right, I get a bit of trouble, a bit of trouble because I handled the, uh, the. Some of the press people came to me, and, and I think Tommy was away or something. And I was, I, it was on, on the radio, I think, and uh, I, I, came, I was commiserating with the destructiveness of the, because they had lost an awful lot of jobs, tremendous amount of jobs. And I uh, had a few, uh, got reported back home, and I, I, when I got back, one or two drew me up about, you know, with all the sympathy for Middlesbrough for like, I said, oh, well, I said, yes, you know, you don't stop with a human being because, <laughs> because you're a Scottish nationalist. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't normally go to Archbishop's palaces, but, um, you know, when you, you went in there, the, the actual scale of the building was fantastic. And then I thought the interesting thing was that the scale of his knowledge was also quite dramatic. Um, 
he wasn't just sitting there saying, you're doing a good job, lads. I think you should carry on and do it. He was actually understanding what the problem was. Well, it, it, uh, of course, it was where I was born. Uh, I've only been in Scotland 40 years, uh, but I came originally from York, and the Archbishop of York had his little palace just up the road from where I was born. And so I said to the guys, come on, now we should go and see the Archbishop of York. Why? Well, a senior churchman in England with his contact. The sort of person who will be having dinner with or informally meeting some of the powers that be in London, uh, some of the people in government. Uh, and the idea of the lobbying and the march was to try and draw your net as widely as possible, uh, to draw people in from all sorts, all parts of society. And the Archbishop was well briefed. Um, and the meeting was uh, really quite unusual, uh, but I think it was, I would say, quite successful as well. Because by then the people who were on the march had become not professional lobbyists, but experienced lobbyists. Uh, and they held their own. Uh, and they were an impressive bunch of people. <laughs> we, had, we had tea with the Reverend John, uh, who was a very good listener. Uh, and picked up uh, on all the points that we were talking about and, and obviously indicated that he was, was very much interested and very much supportive. I must say so was his wife, uh, who, who's, to me, political leanings was probably akin to my own. <laughs> and uh, she, she gave us tremendous support and encouragement. I remember that there were three vans and two of them were just kept immaculately and there was just a stud van that I was in, there was just a tip, there was no other word to describe it and, you, and and it was freezing cold, you know, it was January so that you, you came back to the van and you were very reluctant to even get undressed or have a shower because it was just so cold and so you were virtually going to bed in your clothes, getting up in your clothes and uh, it was just pretty unsanitary and I think I moaned enough to the, the news editor that halfway through he says, well look, book into a hotel for the night and I just remember turning up at this hotel and unshaven in these uh, waterproofs and claiming there was a couple of rooms booked for us and I can remember the receptionist thinking, are you sure? Because I think she thought there was a couple of down and outs that just walked in. The way that each day was planned was actually a bit haphazard and what happened in the second or third day we started losing people <laughs> and it, it took us as long to find them again and get them back on board and I must have made the some point that I must have made um, a comment that you know this could be better organized and I got the job of organizing the, the actual walking and it was fairly easy when we all sat down and said, you're going there, you're going there, we're picking up there, there, there. And we knew where we were. But, you know, it was just a wee bit too haphazard. So it, it came from nowhere. It was just, that was just one of the many things that came out of that uh, with that number of people working together. There's no doubt that when you get in away from tiny Scotland into the Midlands or the south of England, uh, you know, it's pretty evident there's a lot of competition to get into the newspapers, to get any sort of coverage. And, you know, we did have an amusing night one night where uh, a, a journalist arrived and he was pretty ignorant when he did arrive and said, oh, I don't really want to cover this. I'm really here, uh, you know, just because my editor told me, what's this Garkosh thing all about? And I had a bit of fun and sat him down and told him it was about our the EU and the fact that the EU were changing the size of the fishing nets and the people at Garkos were no longer able to catch the fish that we'd caught for many years and it was going to, they didn't change a lot of things would have to be changed and it was a valuable lesson I hope for him that the next time he meets Scots coming down from England and a pretty serious thing that he treats them with some seriousness. We didn't all walk together, we walked in relays uh, and uh, Sometimes you were walking yourself, sometimes you were walking with two or three people. Uh, depended how uh, 
but the, every step of the, 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 the way was, was, was walked by one of us, at least one. Normally it would be half a dozen because there were nothing worse than sitting in a caravanette all day, so you would, you would be walking along along with whoever was on duty. Things I remember is, you try to tell young folk this, but there was no mobile phones in those days, so I had to get up every morning and find a phone box. I, finding a phone box in January in the snow and the ice, and you're standing there at perhaps 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning, creaking open the door of an old red phone box, checking to see if the, the handset was actually there, checking to see if it actually worked, and uh, making this phone call to your news editor back in Glasgow, who's sitting there with a warm desk with a cup of coffee. And I'll, I'm doing this moaning down the phone at me about how cold it is. Tell me about the ISTC letting the dirty dozen use the baths in Sheffield. <laughs> well, obviously the sort of washing facilities wasn't off the best, uh, although we were always one of the rules on the march was the hygiene and it had to be it had to be correct at all times except for a certain fridge, uh, which maybe you'll hear more about later on. But. Uh, the uh, when we got to Sheffield, by that time it was it was going to be nice a nice thought if we could have a bath somewhere, and it was it was arranged that uh, the public baths would be open for us, and we'd be able to go there and get a sauna and a, and a wash. And we were in the dirty dozen, we all came out clean and spick and span, and it was a new Tommy and his followers that came out. <laughs> It was agreed that we would not enter the town uh, in the normal way. We would stay outside it and uh, we would march in the following morning. They, they wanted to sort of again show the support and the solidarity that was sort of familiar with still people. Uh, and we were only too happy to, to agree to that and that, that's what we did. Uh, and the next morning, uh, I think we were supposed to go on buses, but the buses didn't turn up. And what turned up was two bands uh, to, march, <laughs> to march us in. And, uh, and we did march in uh, with the bands. So we were all looking forward to getting there. And it was a host of amusing incidents there. We arrived and the bus that was supposed to be bringing the pipe band had broken down. So the only band that the Corby Town Council could wrestle up quickly was the Purple Heart Flute Band. And that was quite amusing. They'd been told that they'd only to play the theme tune to Hogan's Heroes and nothing else. But despite this uh, friendly move, it still became two gap kosh marches, the ones that we'd walk behind the orange band and the ones that still want, <laughs> they preferred the pavement. Uh, I can always remember saying to one of the guys, come on, join us, get in and join us. Uh, and they said, I'm not marching behind them. <laughs> and then I, I suddenly noticed that uh, well, I hadn't paid particular attention to what the bands were, and, and then it dawned on me one of them was the Orange Band, and this guy was a Celtic supporter. <laughs> the, the flute band meeting us in the outskirts and uh, marching in made us feel really, very good. And of course, it wasn't just that, it was the number of Scottish accents that were around us all the time, which was wonderful. And uh, we had tremendous support at Corby. They gave us a civic reception that night and was very kind to of them. Uh, and they, they made it a memorable stopover uh, and we, I'll always remember their kindness and uh, you know all of our friends uh, that night uh, I was taken on the tour of all the all the pubs and all the clubs and there are many pubs and clubs in Corby and I was taken on a tour because the, the, the Corby guys were saying well look we, we've got to go and make a personal appearance because we're collecting for you and money's going into the fighting fund and so therefore it was my duty to go along uh, and I had to savour a little sip of rum at each place so uh, it was a memorable occasion and uh, I'll always be thankful to the people of Corby and all our friends down there for the reception that they gave us. When we were sleeping in our vans that night there was people coming at two and three in the morning and not on the door and handing in bottles of whiskey and money. So, you know, the good people of Corby certainly lived up to their reputation of being friends of Scotland. Luton was our last stop uh, because we were going to march from Luton into London. I can always remember we had a problem parking and we parked up and uh, 
we couldn't find a place at first, and then we got parked up, and uh, then the police came and moved us on, and uh, they weren't very helpful actually because they couldn't advise us where to go to. They just wanted us either clear of the town, but uh, they didn't want us parking. And a guy came along and they said, look, if you need a place to park, come along and park in here. And it was a social club, <laughs> which was pretty handy because we got the three vans in and uh, and then we were able to go in, the, we, we went into the club and we, we actually got a meal in there. They were actually waiting for, or, or well, any place where you could park, they moved us on. There was a, a definite um, feeling that word was out. And someone was saying, hassle those guys. That's how I felt. But en route, there was very little, other than the evening times, obviously because we were covering it every day, there was very little coverage. But once they approached London, suddenly they were getting, um, other press were turning up, you know, suddenly the bear reporter would arrive from the Telegraph or from the Guardian or whatever, uh, or a camera crew, and just that sense that, the, the end was in sight and also really the sense that people were still taking an interest. Remember that, they did, they brought Iron Brew in, in Blackburn and we, we formed a circle and we were juggling about, I can remember. Uh, yep, and uh, that was us, we, we, we had arrived, that was a celebration. Uh, uh, I can, you know, I can think of a few better celebrations than that one, but uh, anyway, Iron Brew and Blackburn will always be It'll always be embedded in my memory as the, the day that uh, we reached London after the long walk. They didn't know when they set out what kind of coverage they were going to get. Can you imagine if they got all the way to London and nobody turned up? It's a bit like, imagine throwing a party and nobody came. That sense of that must have gone through Tommy's head. So when they actually got to the outskirts of London and getting the interviews from uh, the press that had turned up to see them just got the impression across them, yes, this has mattered and we're going to get a lot of publicity when we get to Downing Street. I, th I think the biggest hope at that stage was maybe we will actually see the Prime Minister. Uh, that was the hope. And right up to the last minute, I, I recall we were fairly hopeful that that might happen. Uh, the 14th of January, you stood at the top of Downing Street ready to present. Your economic case. Can you tell me a bit about that then? Well, obviously we couldn't all go into uh, number 10 and we picked the delegation that had to go in. Uh, and uh, So when we got into number 10, we knocked on the door and uh, we asked if we could see Mrs Thatcher because it had been well publicised that we were going to be there. We'd made sure that she knew we were, we were looking for a, a meeting with her and we had a, a petition that we were going to present to her for the retention of steel in Scotland. Uh, but unfortunately we were told that uh, Mrs Thatcher wasn't available. She was actually having tea with Ian Botham that day. So. The lad that answered the door and said, "If you know, that if you want to pass in, and it was obviously referring to a petition, uh, we'll see that she gets it." And I said, "No, no, she can't get it in person. She's not getting it at all." They knew we were coming. It was in all the television programmes. It was we were doing interviews all the way down. I mean, they knew we were coming. She had plenty of time to arrange a meeting or something. I just couldn't understand that. I thought it was very ignorant, to be honest. With you. It was a disappointment, but I don't think MD was greatly surprised at the end of the day that that happened, but it's a measure of the stupidity, I think, of the government that they, they were so scared that they, that they couldn't even face the Garkos marchers. Well, if she's not going to see us, we'll go and see her boss, we'll go and see the Queen. Uh, we'll go out to Bucket Palace and see if the Queen will see us. <laughs> and we went along to Buckingham Palace, as you know, and, uh, and myself, Jim Wright and uh, Tommy Brennan and we delivered a letter to the Queen and uh, what she replied, you know, which is, 
nice, you know, and she also expressed concern about the, the situation, so I think, uh, you know, it was the right thing to do. Uh, we did get a, a letter from the Queen uh, clearly telling us that she had received uh, the petition uh, and that she would see that it was passed on to the appropriate people, which was as much as we could expect, uh, and we were delighted with that, to be quite honest with you. Business about the Thatcher thing, that didn't surprise me whatsoever, and, I, and a bit of me was saying, well, this is you, I mean, hell menges, you know. Yep, the, the debate that was scheduled for that day, the steel debate was then changed from steel to defence. Uh, and uh, <coughs> unfortunately it was going to be rescheduled, the steel debate was going to be rescheduled, but as we had been away from home for 14 days, we had all taken sort of holidays of leave of absence from our work, we had to come home and go back to work again, and unfortunately we could not wait for the steel debate uh, and so we had to come back again. Uh, it was a total letdown to be quite honest with you, uh, something that we couldn't pre-plan. Uh, it was bad enough Thatcher not meeting us but not being able to get the debate on steel uh, was a total disappointment. I caused a bit of a stir because one of the guys I was on the match with allowed me to get, to get cosh when British Steel were still denying that this was all going to happen, uh, they were denying that it wasn't imminent and what have you, and he'd get me in to get cosh and I shot got cosh with absolutely no steel in it at all, and it made the front page of the paper, I think it made the television as well, but I mean, British Steel went absolutely crazy the next day that these pictures had appeared, because I shouldn't have been allowed to get in there, but I did get in there. On the train back up there was guys going around saying that Oh, that was great. We got rid of Heseltine, uh, a cabinet minister. Well, yeah, big deal. Uh, shortly afterwards, got Kosh shut, and not that long after, Ravens Creek shut in Scotland. I don't think has ever really recovered from a uh, production point of view. The satisfying thing you might say about all this is that little did they know as they stood up and voted down the Scottish Steel jobs that they were signing the execution one of all their colleagues in Scotland because of the subsequent election there wasn't a Conservative flat standing, which uh, gives me great pleasure given what I know about the duplicity that was going on at the time to try and stop the steel campaign being successful. As the chairman of the Ravens Craig Joint Committee, Garkosh was part of my responsibility. So I was a, a, sort of involved with Garkosh right up to the very end, in fact, uh, it was myself that led the delegation to negotiate the closure terms of Garkosh. We spent a lot of time, went down to Dover House in London um, with uh, the Scottish leader of the party, Malcolm Bruce at the time, to try to persuade them. Uh, but the Tories were very much market-orientated market at the time and they wouldn't contemplate interfering with what the market was doing. But it wasn't just the places like Ravenscraig that affected, it affected the whole community. It was the follow-on effect that these things have. You know, because all the other businesses round about Ravenscraig, they shut down as well because they're no longer, people don't have the money to spend anymore. So they really shut down a community when they shut a steel works like Ravenscraig. I suspect that there was a tacit understanding between certain people in government and British Steel, that this was the way ahead. They were going to concentrate on the plants in South Wales and we were going to lose uh, the steel industry in Scotland. Uh, so this was the sober story that was beginning to emerge. And I think that's why, and once Gart Kosh had gone, uh, we were uh, at a significant disadvantage because the Gart Kosh business in the jargon of the steel industry, the added value when it went through the Garkosh mill of the steel that was produced was quite enormous and we lost it. And so Ravens Craig was uh, an isolated plant on its own. Of two people, I was one of the first employee at the, at the hot mill in Ravens Craig and was in at the rolling of the first bar. And I get a telephone call from the hot mill to say that the, 
they were rolling the last bar at midnight that night and the lad who'd taken over from me because I had then um, joined uh, one of the training programs and had done for a little while and they said Jim would you like to come in and roll the last bar as a speed operator so I went in at that time and it was it was sad but I appreciated the lad stepping down to allow me to go in in the last to go in, in the last bar. Hmm. Yeah, I remember they had a dinner uh, celebrating, pardon, celebrating the end of steel making in Scotland, and this dinner was held, and management came from Ravenscraig and also from the High Hegians in British Steel. And I remember saying to the plant director, because they'd asked me to say grace, should I say, for what we are about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful, because we were not thankful. You said in the BBC documentary that if the Conservative Party continued to ignore the voice of the Scottish people, that uh, they wouldn't have Scotland any longer, and the consequences of that will be very serious indeed. If you saw that coming 25 years ago, why didn't the Conservative Party see that? Well, I think they see it now. <laughs> uh, the, the problem is that, you know, the damage is done and they'll never repair it. I mean, I think it's fascinating that here we are, 25 years after I made that forecast. Uh, and, you know, it's proven to be true. And, you know, it's now a generational thing. Uh, I'm not claiming it was all to do with the steel industry, but the steel industry was the catalyst that sent it off without any question. And you know, even today, the Conservative Party in Scotland are perceived as anti-Scottish, uh, and I think that was the, the thing about the steel campaign. Any, anyone who examined it, it didn't matter if it was a working man, it didn't matter if it was a managing director of a big business. If they examined the case, the case for Scottish steel was so strong that no one with a brain in their head could understand what the agenda was here for closure. And of course the agenda was privatisation. In other words, it was a, a dogmatic, uh, political motivation rather than an economic one. And of course that lost them all support in Scotland because people just can't see the sense in following dogma in any political party to the point where you start doing economic damage on the scale that the steel closures did. I often quote the Financial Times, a stuffy old London newspaper, that said there was no community more deserving of help than the Ravenscraig community and Motherwell for what they have done in recent years. And so in terms of the campaigning, um, I think there was a lot of recognition that we closed not because we had failed, but because of factors out with our control, but the factors we did control were controlled effectively and the plant remarkable uh, in its operation in the last few years. And so I think the people who were intimately involved in it can still look one another in the eyes and say we did what we could. In the end we knew that the powers that be would be stronger than we were, but I tell you what, uh, you do what you can. Uh, and I think it was a, a good job that was done. I went, not having, a, not having much a clue about what the whole thing was about, but believe me, I knew what it was all about by the time I came by, and I was equally as anxious for what was happening up here as any of the rest of them were, um, whereas before it was just another job to me, but Tommy and some of the other guys speaking to them, they changed all that. There's no doubt that in my mind that the success of the march was not so much uh, uh, saving Garkosh, which obviously it didn't, but what it did was it, it put off the closure of Ravenscraig for a number of years, which allowed people time to either retrain or think of where they're going to go in the, f the future. And it also meant a huge amount of money which was poured into, into Lanarkshire for redevelopment, sums of money which I'm sure would never have been allocated by a Tory government if it had not been for the, the fight that the unions put up over the steelworks. The, the standout thing from the march is the, the genuine friendship that existed between 
all the marchers. Everyone got on great without exception. There was no one that was uh, in any way a problem over the whole period. Everyone, you know, approached it. And given the weather, there had to be an element of humour in it as well. And I think the, the sense of humour that people shared over the, the, the period was very important because I think that kept us together in quite trying circumstances in some days. Uh, I, I just wish I had seen the whole thing through. Obviously getting a job was uh, important, uh, but it would have been good to go all the way down because I, th I think I was beginning to get, by the time I got to concert, I was beginning to get over the fact that some of these people weren't in the same political party as me and I was beginning to like them as uh, fellow human beings. Uh, so it would have been good to go all the way down to London. And the one thing about the politicians that were on that trip, the Jim Bannermans and, and the SNP guys and Lawson and that, absolutely, I, I couldn't have told you what party was what. I couldn't have kept, they were just decent, nice guys. There wasn't any, any shortage of people willing to uh, sing a wee song and, or tell a joke or just carry on. In a sense, in a very minor local sense, it, it made a difference in my life because I went on from uh, from the march to writing about industry full time, and eventually, as I say, I was down in London getting an award from Princess Anne for for writing about industry. And it's just a odd thought to go from a, a camper van en route to London to standing on a platform with Princess Anne. So it was it was a strange journey for me. Since then, of course, all the newspapers had industrial reporters, but as industry closed down, so did the, the role of industrial reporters. So we were the, the final group, as it were, of industrial workers that were made redundant because of the uh, closure of industry. Are you proud to have been part of the Gartkosh March and the fight to save the steelworks? Enormously proud of being part of the Gartkosh March and of the whole fight for Scottish I think it was a very honourable fight, I think it was the right fight, I think, you know, people did listen in Scotland and sometimes people say, you know, nobody's interested in politics, nobody's interested in these things. And, you know, anyone who was involved in the Guard Coast campaign knows the ordinary people on the street were genuinely empty. They thought they'd never been near Guard Coast, didn't know anything about Guard Coast, other than what they'd read in the newspapers. But there was an, an inherent feeling in Scotland that what was happening here was serious and was very, very wrong. Just because uh, Scotland voted differently from the rest of Britain didn't mean that the Tories had to punish the country. I don't think I see it as anything that benefited me because I, I, I don't think it did benefit me. I, I really, there are still people who remember it and that, the memory of people is, is so important. And I really do think that if we put markers down at different stages in our life, and for things that we think are important, the things that can change, and that did change, it changed badly for us, but if it had changed the other way, it could have been wonderful. Some small holding within Scotland of, of some basic engineering in, in West Central Scotland would have been wonderful. I, I cannot other than, I cannot think other than that was the right thing to do at the time. Uh, it was all, all about Scotland itself, about the local area, about Motherwell and Lanarkshire, uh, the economy of Motherwell and Lanarkshire, the economy of Scotland, because it was going to have a, a knock-on effect onto them. Uh, you know, and in retrospect, looking back, uh, 1980, McGregor wanted to close the plant. We said no, we were going to fight it. It was eventually closed in 1992, but we got 12 years, 12 good years of adding uh, to the economy in, in, in the area, to add to our own pensions as well, because we, we've got another 12 years pension out of it, uh, 12 years wages out of it. Uh, and although it was a disaster, and it was a disaster for us in the steel industry, although it was a disaster at the time, since then Lanarkshire has picked up. There's no doubt about it. We've now got a diversification of industry in Lanarkshire. You know, in, in, in the early days when we had 
the Ravens Craig, we had Clydesdale, we had DL, we had John Williams, we had all the uh, with the Clyde Alloy, all steel industry, and Lanarkshire practically was totally dependent on heavy industry in those days. Uh, and if sort of if one hiccup the rest had the flu sort of thing, uh, nowadays because of the diversification of industry in Lanarkshire, it's a much healthier county, healthier county. You know, an industry can close and a plant can close, but it doesn't bring on the sort of catastrophic effect that uh, the Ravenscraig, the closure of the Ravenscraig. Uh, was well we thought would 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 would, would happen. Uh, it was a fundamental part of changing my whole opinions about um, where we should be going with our country, uh, and I'll never forget it for that reason. Was it, <clears throat> it one of the most necessary things they had to do? Uh, 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 no qualms about it. Uh, uh, even at my age, I would still do it if I was asked to do it. I think it was. I think it was a wonderful gesture, and the comradeship on that march was absolutely first class. The Shropshires were blessed in that they had a very talented number of people. Bill Irvin, Jordy Quinn in particular were fantastic with figures. I mean, Bryce Dio would come out with a slanted document at 9am in the morning, and by 1, one o'clock lunchtime, Jordy. Uh, Bill and others had sat down and examined it, came back and told you where it was slanted, explained why it had been slanted that way and just completely rubbish the case they were trying to make. Uh, a great guy, I uh, had a mind sharper than a, than, than a calculator. I can always remember in negotiations in the plant, uh, George sat on one side of me, Bill Evans sat on the other side. Uh, and <coughs> George whenever management was making their proposals to us in respect to whatever, uh, if there were any calculating to be done before the manager finished speaking, George would be pushing a piece of paper in front of me which would tell me exactly what the guy was saying. Uh, and he was fantastic. Uh, just quietly say to Bill, right, think of a proposal. Uh, and I would keep, it was my job to keep them going, keep the debate going and bounce it around, sometimes for 10 minutes, sometimes for... 50 minutes, but whatever, Bill eventually shoved the piece of paper over in front of us and the minute that happened I would say to the joint branches, well look, uh, Bill's got a proposal here he would like to put to you and I want you to give it consideration and we'd ask Bill to put his proposal and he would do that and a hundred out of a hundred times it came off. If he gave you his word, he would deliver. And there was never any trouble. The negotiations were always conducted in a dignified and appropriate manner. Uh, and so George himself had a fair amount of credibility, not just within the trade union movement, but also within management himself, itself. Uh, and uh, privilege, I was privileged to count him as one of my friends. Obviously, um George Quinn and Bill Irvin are no longer with us. Yeah. Do you have any memories of them or just, just what kind warm, of men they were? Warm, warm memories. I mean, I just, I thought they were the souls of the earth. They really were. They were people that I would be delighted to be with any day of the week. Tripping on a top rope Thoughts are whirling like a cyclone It's a mess, you know my mind's blown Oh no How could this happen to me? It feels like a hundred degrees Fire fights fire and burns I'll never learn Tossing a
chasing a shadow.